קנו רבנן, נר חנוכה, מצווה להניחו בפתח ביתו מבחוץ. And as we all know, Rashi explains, משום פרסום הדניסה. We all know that we light the Hanukkah candle and we put it at the entrance of our home. Hanukkah, to proclaim the name, to the, proclaim the miracle, to publicize the miracle, we all know that Hanukkah is all about dispersing or, sorry, not dispersing, or maybe dispersing, the Garesh Tachoshev, eliminating the light, the darkness. And how does one eliminate the darkness? Through light, that's the Jewish way. As the Baal Shem Tov says, a little bit of the light disperses a lot of the darkness. And we take the mitzvah of Hanukkah, and the mitzvah of Hanukkah is so special. There are other mitzvot of proclaiming Zecher Anes or Pirsum Anes, for instance, like Megillah, reading Megillah, or Sukkot. But what's so special about Hadlakat Nerot Hanukkah, where lighting, um, uh, where uh, Kriyat Megillah, we can do it anywhere. We could do it in our house, in shul, outside. Sukkah, we totally do it outside. But lighting the candles, we need a home. We light from within and we spread the light. We want to share the light with the whole world. That's what Hanukkah is all about. Dispersing, getting rid of the darkness. And how do we get rid of the darkness? As um, Rav Kook said, he said, When the neshama shines, even the darkest, the grayest sky, the grayest heaven, is dispersed, or, or there is, sorry, there is light and the darkness is dispersed through the shining of the neshama. And when we take that idea of shining from within, what it means is, is that we take the Torah, the Jewish values of Chaviv Adam Niv of believing in a compassionate God, of kol adam nivra b'tzerem enohim, through Torah and mitzvot, that is the way from shining with authenticity, standing up for what we believe in, for our values. That is the way that we can mend this world. That is the way that we can disperse the darkness. And that is what Hanukkah is about, taking the light from within our home, from within ourselves, from within our essence, and sharing it with the world. Today is a great, it is a great honor for us to, to host this panel with two great leaders who share these values. Rabbi Abi Weiss, I've been hearing about you a lot. We've never met, but Karen, uh, but you are Karen's mentor and a lot of people here. And really it is an honor to host you here in Matan. And Michal, Michal, um, it's totally an honor. You're doing amazing work in the world and we really thank you for that for standing up for Israel, for sharing the light with the world and telling everyone these are the Jewish values, compassion, um, um, inclusiveness, morality. This is what we're all about. And we're not, we're not just keeping it to ourselves, but we want to spread the light and proclaim the miracle of Am Yisrael. And we really appreciate that. And this is what we wish to do. This is what we do in Matan. The Torah that we learn here in Matan, we wish to not just leave it in the Beit Midrash, but connect to the world around us through all the programs that we do, starting at a young age with our Bat Mitzvah program, which is an international Bat Mitzvah program, but I had the privilege to have you, Michal, with your daughter, Daniela, in 10 years ago in the Bat Mitzvah program here. I can't believe that's 10 years ago that you have a Bat Mitzvah girl 10 years ago and that I have a whatever. I've been doing it for a long time. So we start really grooming female leaders from, from really a young age through the classes for women and men. We don't exclude men here, as you know. Um, through the, the classes, through our Tuchniot Halacha, our Tuchnit Morot Halacha, where we um, train women to be Meshivot Halacha. And Rabbanit Karen Jackson is a graduate of our first program of Morot Halacha, and she is a Meshivat Halacha. 
So we are very, very um, proud of you. And really, um, our idea is um, preparing grooming leaders that stand up for the values of Israel and stand up um, with Torah proud in the world and spreading the light. And I want to thank you, Rabbi Karen Jackson and Tammy Levy, for making this happen and preparing this evening as the other evenings of Mitzvah Chabrin. And I want to thank all of you that have come tonight to stand with us and spread the light together. So before we begin, I'd like to together um, say a prayer, say Perek Tilim, Shir um, Lamalot. Together we could say it and we should dedicate it for our Chayalin, the success of our Chayalin, for the wounded soldiers and for the Chazarab, all of the Shvim and Nedarim and for the Hatzlachav Am Yisrael. So together let us say Shir Lamalot. Esai <laughs> Adonai ishmorcha mikol ra, ishmor et nafshecha. Adonai ishmor tzedcha uvoecha, me'ata ve'ad olam. Okay. Thank you, Rabbanit Oshra. My guests tonight don't really need introduction, but just in case you are not familiar with their work, here is a bit about them. Uh, I'm excited to bring these two modern day Maccabees together. Um, and I know there are multiple layers of connections we'll talk about soon. Uh, I'll begin with Michal. Michal kotler Wunsch is a prominent public speaker, researcher, and independent policy and strategy advisor on intersecting issues of anti-Semitism, law, human rights, and Zionism. She is currently serving as Israel's special envoy on combating anti-Semitism. Michal was a member of Israel's 23rd Knesset, uh, where she chaired and was an active member of numerous committees relating to anti-Semitism and on other security issues. Michal is also a trustee in the Rabbi Sachs legacy and uh, was involved in combating online anti-Semitism. She received her LLB from Hebrew University, LLM from McGill University, and has been involved in a number of orga other organizations, the Jewish Federations of North America, Nefesh Benefesh, and worked at the IDC Herzliya. She lives in Ranana with, uh, with her husband and four children, and their four children. On a personal note, um, like many of you here, I am proud to call Michal my friend and so grateful for the work you are doing for Israel and the Jewish world. Rabbi Avi Weiss, is the founding rabbi of the Hebrew Institute of Riverdale, the Bait, a congregation of 850 families in, Bron in the Bronx, New York. Now, Rabbi Emeritus, are you there? Mm -hmm. And uh, he is also the founder of Yeshivat Chovavei Torah, Yeshivat Maharat, and the co-founder of the International Rabbinic Fellowship, all parts of his vision to promote open orthodoxy. Rav Avi, as he is known among his students, served as the national chairman for the student struggle for Soviet Jewry from 1982 to 1991, and as national president of AMCHA, the Coalition for Jewish Concerns, and uh, where they did a lot of activism around the world. He's the author of a few books, Women at Prayer, Spiritual Activism, and Open Up the Iron Door, uh, Memoirs of the Soviet Jury Activists, and Journey to Open Orthodoxy. I can say I've read Three out of the four. <laughs> I'll let you guess which. On a personal note, I have to share that Rabbi Avi Weiss is my first rabbi. I grew up in the Hebrew Institute of Riverdale. And I can honestly say that my decision to be here to make Aliyah and to choose a career of Torah and Jewish activism and communal leadership it was first inspired by Rabbi Avi Weiss. So I'd like to invite you both to come up here. So, um, we'll begin. We'll begin. Are 
going to begin with our questions. Here's um, how this is going to work. I'm going to ask uh, questions alternately to Rabbi Weiss and to Michal, and, uh, and then some of the questions will uh, we'll cover both of them. Okay, Rabbi Weiss, we're going to begin with you. You have been a role model to me in the world of Israel and Jewish activism, basically since I could walk. Uh, when I think about, uh, recently I've been teaching Parsha here at Matan, Parsha and Contemporary Issues, and when we learned Lech Lecha, uh, I came across a Midrash, which is so powerful for this moment, that Abraham is called Ha'ivri, and the Midrash, one of the opinions of the Midrash, Rabbi Yehuda and Rishi Rabba says, it's because the whole world was on one side and he was on the other, hey there. Right? He was on the other side of the, of the ideology. He was the one who could see the moral clarity that the rest of the world could not see. And I think this is meant in a positive sense, of course, being able to call out injustice when others can't see it or don't yet uh, uh, respond to it. I think of you also, another Abraham, Rabbi Abraham. Uh, and I'd like to ask you to talk about how you first decided to hear the call of spiritual activism um, over the years. I know I've, I've even joined rallies, <laughs> gone down, downtown to Manhattan to join you. Um, Sylvia Jury was, was a little young for that. And, uh, and after that, uh, when they were trying to put up a convent in Auschwitz and the Amia Bahami in, um, in South America, in Buenos Aires, numerous things. So I'd love to ask <clears throat> you to share here, not everyone here is familiar. Um, would you please share some of your activist Torah and experiences with us? Sammy, open up the phone to the to. Everyone. So Karen, I'm, I'm so delighted to be here and to see someone who calls herself a Tamida become my baby, my teacher, is is the greatest zahut. His parents, as we get older, our children begin to take care of us. The wheels have turned, but blessed is the parent who could look at his or her children or students and say, I want to be like you. And I'm so very proud of, of all that you've accomplished. And to be on a panel with you, Michal, is a tremendous kavod. You have brought so much dignity, so much hadar to Am Yisrael. It's not simple in the halls of the United Nations to speak truth to power, but that's what you do. And God should bless you many, many more years of such advocacy. And I feel a special connection to you because of my relationship to your parents, to your dad, and to your mom. I'm sure you know that Erwin Cutler is one of the great human rights activists of our time. And Michal actually whispered in my ear that most recently, he's under police protection in Montreal because of the strong advocacy for Israel. But if I could sum up what your father means to all of us, is that Erwin and your mom understand the delicate balance between particularism and universalism. No one does it better than your father, who understands that a strong sense of national identity, a strong sense of Adat Israel, does not contradict our universal consciousness, but it's a prerequisite to do it. So please send them my love. And I'm humbled to be here because I know that in front of me are people living in Israel, who have children, spouses, relatives who are in Svag and Ali Israel, and for me, the holiest Jew on the face of this earth is one who was in Svag and Ali Israel, and to be in the community 
where Arya and Arya's family lives, who was Moser Nachshol, who gave his life for Medinat Israel. I still remember being at the funeral of Benji Hillman in the Second Lebanon War. And I echo the beautiful words we heard that all the Khatutin should come home, our soldiers should come home, Shlinyin, home, and that the wounded should be completely healed. With that, a few words related to what you asked, which is what inspires the activism. Like most of us, I was inspired by my, my parents on the other side. I don't remember her having any uncles and aunts. They all perished during the Shoah. And my father was actually raised in the town of Auschwitz, which was then called Oshvenshin, which became Auschwitz. And I grew up with his stories about those days. And their sense of never again was something that has been instilled within me from the time I was a little child. In a book on spiritual activism, very briefly, I talk about a foundational idea of activism, a pillar idea, and a principle. The foundational idea of activism is the idea of covenant, of breed. When God created the world, God created an incomplete, imperfect world. And God's last word in the creation story was lasot. Now you do, mandating human beings and ultimately on Israel within that larger framework to work in partnership with God to redeem the world. And as a youngster growing up, I started reading Arthur Moss's book, All Six Million Died, the great David Wyman's work on the American abandonment of the Jews. And then inspired by such great, great leaders as Jacob Birnbaum, the father of the Soviet German movement, and also Glenn Richter, whom I consider the tzaddik of the movement. I, my generation, many here, I'm sure this could reverberate, we became never again Jews. Never again will we be guilty of the silence of the past. We understand our mandate to partner with God to redeem Amif Israel, through which God willing that the world will be redeemed. That's the foundational idea of spiritual activism. The pillar is before you can be an activist, you need a couple of loves. And the most important love before you become a Jewish activist is you have to love the Jewish people. <laughs> you have to unconditionally love Am Israel. That doesn't mean I don't love humankind, but just as I have a special love for my wife, who is joining me this evening, Toby, and our inner family, I have a special emotional love for all of our people, to the right, to the left, whatever their politics, whatever their religiosity. For me, the nation of Israel is not just a nation, it's a family. Sefer Breshit is about broken families. And only when the family becomes whole, it's a patriarchal work, only when Yaakov says he cuts in the shimu, and all of his children stand around his bed. Does Breshit, the story of family having become old, end? And Sefer Shmot begins the story of nation, teaching that the best 
model of nation is family. And of course, if we're our family, is there anything we wouldn't to do? So my policy in activism, every time I would read about a need of Am Israel, the nation of Israel, or any part of that nation, I would substitute for the word nation, family. It's my family. And the question was not why show up here or why show up there. The question is, how can I not show up there? It's my family. And the pillar in this book, there are like 50 principles, but for me, the most important principle is a spiritual activist stands up, not necessarily for that which is popular, but for that which is right. That is the reason why most movements begin on the fringe. In the mainstream, not wanting to say anything negative, if you're in the mainstream, you're basically most interested in the status quo. You can't become involved in a cause <coughs> that you may not succeed in. The bureaucracy, the red tape is very heavy. I don't believe there's a movement in history from Adam Adinu who was Avram Ha'ivri, that did not start on the outside of the mainstream. It was true for Herzl's modern Zionist movement. He was a lonely voice. It was true for Martin Luther King, who was told by his black brothers and sisters, go home, Martin, you're a troublemaker. By the way, it was the greatest compliment if someone calls you a troublemaker. <laughs> if Achav called the Yahweh Israel, please tell me, tell me I'm a troublemaker. The Soviet Jewry movement, the movement your father shaped, he stood on the fringe with the Yaakovs and the Glens of this world. And when you stand alone on the fringe, in all probability, there's going to be a great pushback. I thought I would leave that world of activism and just focus completely on spirituality, like ordaining Orthodox women as rabbis. <laughs> <laughs> it's lonely, and what a pushback. But the activist understands that as a lone figure, you can't do it. You have to navigate the criticism and bring everyone along. So Israel may not have been upfront when it came to Ethiopian Jewry or even Soviet Jewry, even Sharansky, but Soviet Jewry and Ethiopian Jewry would not be free today were it not for the ultimate mainstream with the Nazi Israel. Those are the three ideas. The idea of covenant. When we get up there, we're going to be asked, then what did you do? Did you do your share? The idea of love, of Fat Israel. For me, that's the foundation. I'll say something radical, even more than halacha. For me, my halacha is influenced by the love of Am Israel. It's to love unconditionally our people, like our family. And the principle, the test of activism, is not standing up necessarily for what's popular, not standing up when you're sure you're going to win, but you stand up when you're not so sure, because it's right. Okay, we're going to continue to hear more about Rabbi Weiss's activism. Uh, we're going to turn now to Michal. Uh, Michal, you've been researching and speaking about anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism for a number of years. Uh, we've been reading, and I think we're all astonished by what we're seeing now um, in terms of its newest form of anti-Semitism, what we're seeing on college campuses and especially also in Europe, the anger and hate that is coming across toward Israel. 
Can you share with us what is unique about anti-Semitism today and how does this particular form, um, how, how, why is it expressing itself like this now? So first of all, thank you. And I won't go into the great lengths, but thanks. But thank you for organizing this evening and thank you for the honor of participating on the panel with you and uh, a long time, you can imagine a long time here. Thank you, Usher, for um, uh, hosting us here in this incredible place that you built. Um, you know, what? I listen to Rabbi Weiss, and some of you know, you know, as a young kid, I was carried to Soviet jury rallies. I can shout all the shouts and all the chants, one, two, three. We had good ones then, one, two, three, four. <laughs> right? So, and, um, and, I, and, I, and I think about this point of time that we're in um, and what has happened I think what 10 7 did was just expose and make accessible to many, many more people to what, what has been very concerning to those of us who have trapped the mutation of anti Semitism. So I call it the mutation of anti Semitism as an ancient virus. And we know Professor Robert Wistrof, you know, called it the oldest hate in the world. We know that that anti-Semitism mutated over time, and, and actually the late Rabbi Sachs has a really important video to watch and for the younger generation to understand, he makes it very accessible in the way that anti-Semitism mutated by latching onto the guiding social construct of the time, right? Religion, science, and what, what became very apparent actually, and the legacy of my father actually, the living legacy of my father is very important in this, is that the social construct onto which anti-Semitism has latched onto in our time and this is actually heartbreaking, is I'll call it the secular religion of our time, which is human rights, right? So it's devastating because human rights and the international sort of institutions and the uh, rules-based order created post-World War II, if you understand that, you know, by latching on to that, anti-Semitism has been able to mutate and mainstream, and what we see post-107 is just corroboration of that, then you understand that what's at stake is not just the fact that anti-Semitism has mutated to demonize and demonize and apply double standards to the proverbial Jew among the nations that is the state of Israel, just replacing the good old-fashioned traditional anti-Semitism that demonized and delegitimized and applied double standards to the individual Jew, barring him or her from an equal place in society. What's troubling about that is actually, with those three Ds, Natan Cheransky's three Ds, the implication is that the entire infrastructure, that rules-based order, ceases to exist as we know it. Because if you weaponize such an important um, uh, uh, infrastructure that was created to ensure that, Rabbi Weiss referred to it, ensure that never again, right? That prospective commitment, never again. It's a forward-looking commitment. We can't prevent the past. We have, to, we have to learn from the past so that we can identify the threats in the present in order to prevent the atrocities of the future. And what happened on 10-7, and I call it 10-7 intentionally because I've just come back from my third emergency trip to the United States, and to make this accessible to Americans, because it's really important to make this accessible to wide audiences, I, of course, try and reference 9-11. I think that 10-7, like 9-11, challenges our world in ways that we cannot go back to the day before what happened on October the 7th here in Israel. But more awful than the anti-Semitism or this strain of anti-Semitism that enabled the war crimes, the crimes against humanity, and the makings of a genocide, according to international law experts, more awful than that anti-Semitism, if you would ask me, is actually the anti-Semitism that fueled the responses to the atrocities of October 7th, that deny, that justify, that support, and that attack Jews around the world in the wake of the atrocities perpetrated against our people on October 7th. Basically, what happened on October 7th removed multiple masks in the various arenas that I've been tracking. You're right, the international law institutions, the UN being that place in which that initial sort of strain was sent out into the world, right? Zionism is racism, that's 1975, that's decades. But Zionism is racism. When I arrive in law schools today and I say, I am a Zionist, what students hear me saying is, I am a racist. Zionism is racism, Soviet propaganda that was adopted by the UN, then rescinded about 20 years later, is alive and well on 2023, 
North American campuses in the name of progress, which is an unbelievable statement, I think. Soviet propaganda in the name of progress, Zionism is racism. Decades long of the then no less atrocious lie, post-2001 Durban conference in Durban, South Africa, against racism that turned into an anti-Semitic hate fest. And we have to know that it was another turning point, right? Where Israel is an apartheid state became basically mainstreamed in 22 years, because from 2001 till this year, there have been Israel apartheid weeks on every single campus across North America. That's 22 years of graduates. So we have the international law institutions and mechanisms co-opted, weaponized, and appropriated. Then we have university settings in which that additional component of Israel apartheid week became a reality on campus. And finally, the social media spaces. And that is another whole new space, which in the last few years, including as a legislator, the understanding that everything that translated from the Zionism as racism, so Zionist codes Jew in online spaces, by the way, from NAE, continues to threaten, including three days before October 7th and ever since, the Zionist entity from the Zionist cancerous entity in whatever way he decides and you know chooses to refer to Israel, never using the word Jew, never using the word Israel, just using Zionist, Zionist codes Jew. And so basically the intersection of October 7th made it very clear that what those of us that have been paying attention over time and again in law schools more than any, um, there should have been professors that were paying attention, but exactly the opposite happened for the appropriation and the weaponization of international law of these mechanisms created. Those of us that were paying attention on 10-7 were not surprised but I'll say what got me on a plane just days after we buried our Azari, thank you for referring to him in this context. One of our closest friends and like our own child um, was to get on a plane and understand that there is another war that is raging right now as our kids fight here. And that other war actually is raging mostly in North America right now as we speak. In Europe too, but in many ways, I think in Europe, the war might have been lost. In North America, right now, as we speak in the United States, there is a war, an unconventional war for public opinion, and it is raging, and it is raging on university campuses and in, and in, and in street, demonstrations on the streets and in high schools, as we saw just yesterday. And the understanding that with that covenant, and it's so amazing that you mentioned those, because the understanding that with that covenant, that covenant not just of faith, which breaks my heart, but the covenant of destiny, half of us being in Israel, 75 years after the return of our indigenous people to this ancestral homeland, by the, word, by the way, the word indigeneity, the concept of indigeneity is another one of those international law concepts basically stripped from us. Right, And I will make the case in any forum, especially with young students, when I say I'm a member of an Indigenous people, if they're Canadian or Australian, they say, oh, you can't say that. And I say, no, 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 I can't. Not only can I say that, I can prove it. I'm a member of a prototypical Indigenous people, right? That traverses the same land and speaks the same language and reads the same book and practices the same rituals and customs and worships the same God for thousands of years. That's indigeneity. But to understand how far we've come in the application of an irrelevant social construct on our story, we are white colonialist settlers that were sent here by Europeans to colonize Palestinians. Really? That's not my story. So that understanding of 10-7 and what's happening right now as we speak is where that other war is raging. And I'll say one more thing in these emergency trips, and I've taken three since this war began. Um, there are half of us that are boots on the ground right here fighting this existential war in this what i believe is a never again is right now moment an existential war for the survival of the state of israel and for that understanding of our return to this ancestral homeland but that is an existential war exactly is raging on the other side of the ocean with just as many boots on the ground it's just that we have to be able to make accessible to them in my view that they have to fight this war. And in order to be able to do that, thank you for making me realize what it is. It's about the love, right? If all the people, six million Jews that I speak to when I'm in New York, when I'm in, you know, in Canada as well, but mostly in the States in the last few weeks, if they understand that notion of love being the foundation of all of it, 
then they will fight for this family. And they will realize that this existential moment needs them to be the boots on the ground as we are here on the, I call it the front lines, but it doesn't matter if it's the front lines or the home front command, which is all of you, everybody in this space, everyone in this country right now is fighting this war. But that they are the front lines and the boots on the ground, the boots on the ground of that other war with a presumption that we can make accessible to them the love for our people, which has been severed for many, many younger um, Jews in universities, and finally, that most important um, understanding of activism. And I think it's a call to action for this generation, all of them, all of us. So activism here on the ground, and there's not an Israeli that's not an activist right now. My 17-year-old informed me he's not going to be going to school anymore because this is Israel's second independence war, and he's not telling his grandchildren he was in chemistry class. <laughs> so everybody's an activist here. We understand that piece. But I think that you're laughing. But I think that the understanding of activism, of the boots on the ground, made accessible. And by the way, in war, we lose friends. Uh, it is heartbreaking for me when I speak to students who are actually being socially ostracized. I have students saying to me, I'm coming out. I mean, I was a Zionist. I'm done. Post 10 7. I'm coming out. I'm owning my identity. This is it. So it is that moment, and I think that those are the three sort of, you know, um, areas in which that war has been raging, and they all intersected on October 7th. So, sorry to do this too many times, but to change it up a little bit, I'm going to ask you a follow-up question, but you're welcome to take a sip of water while, while I ask. First of all, I also want to, I really appreciate that you're here. I want to share with the audience that um, I was in touch a lot with your staffer, the wonderful Rafi Granoff, and trying to find an chief evening where, staff. a chief of staff, sorry, <laughs> um, trying to find an evening when you were uh, actually in the country before Hanukkah was, um, was, quite a, was quite a challenge, and I'm very thankful to your family for spending it here with us. Um, okay, so the question I want to ask, I, you know, I think that, I, you know, I, I, I definitely I'm asking this a little tongue in cheek, a little bit um, to push to push us a little bit here. Um, you know, we're in Israel, and sometimes I hear uh, fellow Olim or Israelis say, "Well, okay, there's all that anti-Semitism, all that anti-Zionism. Well, just you know, get on a plane and come on over. This is the place to be." And of course, that's one solution. Uh, but you know, in reality. Uh, and we have many friends on Zoom who are with us tonight who are from the United States and elsewhere. Um, what, what is it important for Jews, for us in Israel, to, why is it important for us to be connected, to be, we're obviously horrified by it. And at the same time, what do we, what, what should be our role there? How should we be uh, relating to what they're experiencing? And because we're talking about them on the college campuses finding it, but what about us? What's our role here? So, so I think that October 7th made clear that it's the same them and us. It's not even two sides of the same coin. It's the same side of the same coin, meaning anti-Zionism is the modern, mutated, mainstream form of anti-Semitism. We have to say it like it is. I mean, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition actually post that 2001 Durban conference. There was a very long process, uh, the result of which, a very long democratic process, the result of which created a definition, a definition that's been adapt adopted by more than 30 countries, but within a thousand entities. But the critical understanding of that definition, and again, I'm gonna say the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition, I implore that people understand it and look it up, is to say exactly that. We are experiencing what's now the same side of the same coin. Anti-Semitism in this mutated mainstream form is anti-Zionism. And I said before, anti-Semitism survived for thousands of years by mutating and moving according to it or by latching onto the Biden social construct. Well, what was sort of slipped below the radar was that you can't just shed that Zionist pound of flesh. Well, you can try. And whether you're a Jew or a non-Jew, you can just, you can't shed that Zionist pound of flesh and say, well, I'm just, it's not, I'm, I'm a Jew. I have nothing against Jews or, but it's just Zionists or just that nation state, Israel. What October 7th made very clear is that 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 is the most important understanding that we have to make accessible now to be able to comprehensively identify and combat this strain of anti-Semitism, which not only enabled the atrocities of October 7th, but enabled the responses to the atrocities of October 7th, right? So that anti-Zionism is this form of anti-Semitism from the river to the sea, right? The annihilationist actually echoing the Hamas charter, which has been echoed on campuses, we have to know, for, as I said, 22 years of Israel apartheid weeks, all of a sudden people realize, wait a minute, that's a call to annihilate the state of Israel. 
that's not just some fun chant that rhymes well. People said to me they have better chants than we do from the river to the sea. That is an annihilationist call. It's a call to genocide. It actually echoes the Hamas charter, like Mein Kampf, committed to the destruction of the state of Israel and the murder of Jews. But what I want to say about that question, should we all you know, pack our bags and move to Israel, is actually, I would dare to argue, and maybe it's maybe the wrong Chad, maybe it's more Purim, and I'm going to refer to Esther and to the first attempted genocide by ancient Persia of the Jews and the understanding that we were dispersed, right? That's someone's understanding. Those Jews, they're dispersed. We can just, that's the first call to genocide of the Jewish people. It's an attempt, not the first, but the first in ancient Persia. And now we're experiencing that same current sort of Iran as the um, fuel behind these proxies, Hamas included. The understanding that the first call to action is actually our unity, right? That's the first response, knos et kola yudin, right? That's what Esther says to Mordecai. And he says something to her that's very important and that's been keeping me going this entire time in many conversations. But the first call to action is our unity despite our geographic um, 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 uh, distance. And that's a very important understanding, I think, right now. I don't think that Israel alone and Israelis alone can win in the unconventional war for public opinion that is raging. I think that the Jews are in North America exactly for this moment. Exactly. Literally right now, there are 6 million Jews in North America in positions that are able to, look at this, we're like an historic first where we have sovereignty and independence and an army here. And relative safety. I know it's not easy and there are challenges and you know, there are demonstrations, but relative safety in North America with the ability, and I would say the responsibility to make sure to be boots on the ground in North America, because that is their war to fight. The unconventional war for public opinion is not gonna be able to be fought from here, where people say Israel should, Israel needs to, Israel must. Actually, I turn that statement back towards whoever it is that's saying it. Not only is it about Jews in North America, it's actually about North America. It's actually about foundational values of life and of liberty that are American values through which the Jews now experiencing that backlash or that those attacks as a response to 10-7 have to make accessible. And in many ways, every day I get corroboration for this understanding. For example, if you can deny or justify or support the atrocities of 10-7, <coughs> why not deny or justify or support the atrocities of 9-11? And guess what happened just two weeks ago? Bin Laden's letter circulate to America, circulated on TikTok, the Chinese are utilitarian anti-Semites, not actually anti they're just utilitarian anti-Semites, <laughs> circulated on TikTok, made its way around millions of youngsters in North America that say, hmm, Bin Laden was right. So if Hamas can be right, a genocidal terror organization committed to the annihilation of Israel and the murder of Jews, a proxy of an Islamist genocidal regime in Iran that actually does the exact same to the Iranian people, same modus operandi, right? Rape and burning and abduction, same thing. Then why not Bin Laden? Bin Laden was right. And that is an understanding that I think actually our people have as that responsibility that Rabbi Weiss spoke about in repairing the world, in understanding that we have a role now for democracies. The foundations of democracies are at risk. I don't see 10-7 as a threat only to the Jewish nation state or only to Jews around the world. When I speak to audiences, and it doesn't matter if it's the Halifax Security Forum or complete non-Jewish audiences, and the, ir the irony is that dissidents from Iran, from Putin's Russia, the Uyghurs in China, they understand very well what I'm saying. Very, very well. They are not Jews, but they understand this war on democracy. Who doesn't understand this war on democracy is those of us that, you know, three or four or five generations removed actually think or thought, and that's why we need Rabbi Weiss to remind us, that freedom is free. Freedom was never free. But there is a wake-up call that I believe that 10-7 provides and that we have to make accessible, and therefore, in very many ways, I don't think that now to say, you should just all come to Israel. Of course, anybody who chooses to come to Israel is welcome. And this is the nation state of the Jewish people. And in fact, when I say to people, 
You know, I'm Israel's special envoy for combating anti-Semitism, but Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people. So when I speak to Jewish audiences, I say, I am your special envoy for combating anti-Semitism. That's my role. And that's why I'm here urgently in New York, in Washington, in Chicago, in Boston, in Toronto, in Ottawa. It's why I keep flying there to make very clear that they are not alone in the trenches, but it's also a wake up call for them to know that not only are they not alone in the trenches, they're gonna to have to fight in those trenches. And I'm grateful that they are in the position to be able to fight in those trenches as we are. Thank you, Michal. It is, uh, uh, there is a lot, lot more work to be done. Um, so this is actually a, a great compliment to the question I wanna ask Rabbi Weiss. On the one hand, you're talking both about strengthening us as a Jewish people here in Israel and in Chutzlaret, and, uh, and how to help the Jewish people convey our message, which is very relevant to the world of North America, the United States. Rabbi Weiss, I wanna, first of all, thank you. I want everyone here to know that you are here with us for the, for the war, which <laughs> please God will end soon and uh, everyone will come home safely. And, uh, and yet you are still very much living in the United States some of the time, uh, and you have seen firsthand up close anti-Semitism in many different places and faces. What should, let's talk about Am Yisrael, because we're also hearing some different voices within Am Yisrael. If you look uh, outside the religious communities, there can, there has certainly been until the last decade or two, criticism, fierce criticism of Israel. What should um, Israel be focusing on now? What should we as individuals, whether we are here or there, be focusing on now at this moment? When I think about the different efforts that activists of my generation were involved with, the struggle to free Soviet Jewry, Justice for Yankler Rosenbaum, the Chabad scholar who was murdered because he was a Jew in 1991. Our pursuit of Nazis and demanding that Holocaust memory, that Holocaust memory not be distorted or raising a voice against such anti-Semites who ran for president like Pat Buchanan and David Duke, and anti-Semitism knows no color, or the Farrakhans of this world, or the Khalid Abdul Muhammad's of this world. On and on and on, there's one common denominator. In the end, it was a struggle against anti-Semitism. That's the common denominator for all of the stuff that activists of my era were involved in. So I wanna share with you something that comes from a very deep place that I wish I didn't have to share, but it's something that I believe is important for your consideration. Wherever we traveled in the world, all over the world, from Italy to Turkey to Poland to South America to Buenos Aires, everywhere we went to raise a voice of Adar Israel to fight anti Semitism, the local community told us, Avi, go home. <laughs> Your activities will inspire more anti-Semitism. And what I wish I didn't have to share, but I am sharing with you now, is that I believe that to this day, our community is afraid to raise its voice and declare emphatically, never again, no to anti-Semitism. And that includes the American Jewish community. That includes the American Jewish community. Now, why is it 
that Jews are afraid. This goes back to our personality of over 2,000 years. He is concerned that if we raise a voice for anti-Semitism, and in particular, I'm talking about Jews in the Galut. I'm not talking about Israeli Jewry, who I think have a very different understanding. But in the Galut, if you're going to raise your voice, the consequence is more people will pay attention to you. And the more attention people are paying to the Jewish community, the more vulnerable we are. And one of the most important steps of activism, of spiritual activism today, I believe with all my heart and soul, is to send the message to all Jews, to send this simple message that the more we speak out with Hadar Yisrael, the more our community is protected rather than rendered vulnerable. We have still not gotten that lesson across. That I think is the first Tzav HaShoah. Don't be afraid. Please don't act afraid. Don't be afraid. If you don't lift your voice, you're handing victory to the enemy. The second piece, which Michal this evening and always speaks so eloquently about, we have to call out the new anti-Semitism. Throughout history, there has been anti-Semitism against our people, reaching a crescendo with the Third Reich. Jews murdered because we were Jews. And throughout the millennia, there was Christian anti-Semitism in what Royal Hilberg calls 1500 years of Christian anti-Semitism, where they would say, we're not upset with Jews. We love Jews. We're upset with what you believe in. All you have to do is commit yourself to Jesus. So we've experienced the anti-Semitism against our religion. And for those who don't like the word religion, against our ideology. That was the third anti-Semitism. And that is an anti-Semitism against the land which comprises the Jewish state. This is the anti-Semitism of anti-Zionism. Now, there may be non-Zionists who are not anti-Semites. I don't believe that there are anti-Zionists who are not anti-Semites. Anti-Zionists are anti-Semites. And we have to call this out from the rooftops. No matter where that distortion, the distortion, what I mean, those who are claiming that anti-Zionism is not the issue today of anti-Semitism, we have to call it out. Most recently, I had one of the greatest honors in my life. I penned with my grandson, Eitan Fishberger, and I want to suggest that you look up his site. I call him a phenom. He's doing such extraordinary work on Israel as a Dover Tzahal, and he works in the kind of organization where I ask him, what do you do? What is it called? It's one of those organizations, Sabayaki, if I tell you what it is, I have to kill you organizations. <laughs> we penned a piece, which basically he wrote. He wrote, I slept alone. And it was a critique of the United States strategy to counter anti-Semitism, which this past Shabbat was six months old. We were thinking of doing the piece. How is the strategy doing in the past six months? 
Let me tell you what our critique was, as everyone was lauding it. And there's something to laud. At least they produced a paper. But how do you produce a paper about anti-Semitism today and the word Zionism doesn't appear in the paper even once? How could that be? How could it be that this paper is going to say that there's an alternative definition to era of anti-Semitism, and that is the nexus definition, which would argue that even if we are judged as a double standard, even people who would deny a Jewish land for the Jewish people, that's not anti-Semitism. How could that be? How could it be that when 300,000 people appear in Washington, not only the president of the United States is not there, Okay, but the vice president and her husband, who was a key architect of this paper, is not there. How is that possible? And we shouldn't be afraid to call that out, to make it clear that anti-Zionism today is anti-Semitism. And it's especially the case on campuses. That's where anti-Zionism gets very dangerous because that's the seat of academia with the minds of young women and men who will go on to serve in the State Department, in the Department of Defense, in the executive branch. That's, that's the kind of education that they're, that they're receiving. And you've got to go, literally, if I may, go into the gut of what's happening. And this is the work that our Eitan, and I know, I believe, Michal, you've been involved with. Let me tell you what we have to call out. We have to call out any university that receives money. And there are universities that are receiving hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars, from states that support terrorism or from terrorist organizations. So when you're receiving, as Cornell has received, in the billions of dollars of Qatar, what do you pay for that contribution? As one who's raised a lot of money for these yeshiva <laughs> pitchers, you've got to give something for the $3 billion. Do you know what you give? Suddenly you have on campus professors and other university leaders who believe that Hamas terrorism is ethical, exactly what you said. If we were to ask the 19 people who took planes into the World Trade Center, why did you do what they did? They would say, it was the Musari thing to do. These are professors who are teaching that the Hamas philosophy is Musari. We have to call out those universities and demand an ethics of receiving. Just as when giving stucco, there's an ethics of giving, there's an ethics of receiving. And more than that, there are campuses today that have annexes in these countries, like Northwestern, Texas A&M, Georgetown. They have annexes in Qatar, imagine students from studying journalism and engineering and all of that. They're spending a year in Qatar. You may be intelligent, but we know from the Shoah, the greatest intelligentsia could be brainwashed and believe that this stuff is ethical. Can't be afraid. We have to call it out. We have to call it out when? The Biden administration certainly, certainly made a contribution in their paper, but we have to call it out that you didn't spend time on the real issue today, and that is anti-Zionism. We have to demand of our universities that this is unacceptable. I believe it should be against American law for any American student to be studying in a country 
whose annex of a university is teaching Hamas philosophy. One final word. My life has been a honeymoon life on some level fighting anti-Semitism. Born at the tail end of the Shoah, in society in general, it wasn't the polite thing to be anti-Jewish. Our six million gave us a honeymoon period. My dear, dear friends, the honeymoon period is over. The Shoah is 80 years past. And today, for most of the world, it is a footnote in history. And now all of us, my friends in America, in the establishment, show up. Don't be afraid. Speak truth to power that anti-Zionism, delegitimizing the Jewish state, judging the Jewish state by a double standard, demonizing the Jewish state as Matan in his three Ds talks about, that is unacceptable. Wow. Um... We're coming up to Parshat Baishlach and uh, preparing my class <laughs> on the Barsha. And uh, one of the perspectives, not the only perspective, but one of the perspectives on the uh, struggle between Yaakov and Esau is the opinion of the Ramban and a few others that this is not only a struggle between Yaakov and Esau, but a struggle between Judaism and Christianity, led the world for generations. And sadly, that is feeling, as you've described, very um, appropriate model for what's happening. And we, we have to look to Yaakov as uh, also overcoming that and standing strong in his identity. Ya Yaakov becomes Israel. And so this is really uh, giving me a lot of good material this week. Thank you. Um, so uh, my next question for you. Um, Please, Michal, I'm exhausted. You're exhausted. Okay. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you. <laughs> I don't know if it's fair to do this. I started to ask Rabbi Weiss, and I'm going to throw this out there, and you can decide if you want to. I want to ask. And my the question I prepared for you was to ask a little bit about how you came into this activism, but I want to throw in another piece, which I I think a lot about. Um, Rabbi spoke a lot about the, the essence of family. And you might remember that I was very involved in college and activism and working in pluralistic circles with Orthodox, Reconstructionist, Reform, all sorts of Jews working together. And it's a very, it was a very beautiful thing. And I still have a few friends who I'm close with who are with very different Jewish lives that I did. Um, and at the same time, I am sometimes uh, very, very sad. And, and even angry when and frustrated when I read some of the voices of Jewish leadership, particularly in the United States. Sorry, we're being a little United States centric here. Um, and so I don't know if you want to touch on that, uh, but I'm trying to figure out how to balance that, that Ahaba Israel, the family, one family, and at the same time, uh, where we're hearing voices that are sounding, you know, that, are, that, are, that are struggling also to balance their love for human rights and their love for progressive ideology with their love for Israel. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take a crack at it because I think actually what October 7th did was there was nothing progressive about October 7th. That, that is not progress. So uh, I believe in my liberal values and I believe in human rights and freedom of speech is my area of expertise and I'm, I'm dedicated to it. But that has nothing to do with what the world saw on October 7th. And just to sort of be that by what my wife said, you know, at the very least, the Nazis have had a sense of morality to know, to hide what they did, right? They hid what they did. What happened on October 7th, it was, it was actually live streamed. The footage that we have is primarily from the people who perpetrated, let's see, barbaric savages who actually knew, they knew, that they would receive support across North American campuses. They knew, they were live streaming it. They did not hide what they did. And in many ways, 
That I think is a, a aha moment, including for people in progressive liberal spaces. They do need a little bit of courage and they're a little bit homeless, meaning for years and years, right? Not one women's organization, not one, not one condemned, called out, um, uh, uh, made a statement to say that, that cannot go without a clear unequivocal condemnation, rape, and sexual, barbaric cruelty. Not one women's organization, not one children's organization. It was International Children's Day last week. Not one organization. So there is a moment of reckoning. And I think it's not easy for a lot of people who thought they had found a home where they can be very, very comfortable. And they do need to be um, sort of reached out to. I'll, I'll say that I think that October 7th leaves us with a tremendous responsibility to um, transcend and reach across real or perceived differences of denomination, of religion, of geography, of politics. And there is nothing in the world that I would be able to um, make accessible, more accessible to university presidents. Actually, I've met so many university presidents in the last six weeks. And I say to them, this is not just about the Jewish slash Zionist slash supporters of Israel's very right to exist on your campus that aren't receiving the same protection from your diversity, equity, and inclusion principles. I can like it, I can not like it, I can think it's not great, but the infrastructure exists. And I know that double standards in the application of any principle undermines it. So it can't be that only Jews slash Zionists slash supporters of Israel don't get safety and security according to your DEI infrastructure that's true on campus, it's true online, it's true everywhere. But the moral failing actually for university presidents is way, way higher than that. It's a failure of education, right? The mission statement of education of a university campus is teaching people how to think what we went to university for, it's gone. Students go and learn what to think on university campuses when that is the environment. And if not them, then their friends learn what to think about them. That is a moment of reckoning for those institutions. It's not just about us. And so I think that in many ways, October 7th leaves us with a tremendous responsibility, as I said, to not just be in our echo chambers where we have been, and by the way, we've just emulated the digital spaces that we live in, right? We're all in our little echo chamber, our feed looks different than each other, and we get information that by definition, the algorithm makes accessible to me because it either affirms or negates everything I believe in. So the point is that that's the business model, right? It's a business model that keeps our eyeballs. That, that's how it works. It's a business model. But the understanding that actually the importance of reaching across difference has only become greater after October 7th. The understanding that calling people, especially, you know, I come from a human rights background, so I speak the language of rights. And I can, you know, sort of contest or compete with or um, uh, sit in a law school in which people throw around, you know, human rights terminology and, 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 and actually reach, reach out to them and say, that's not what that term means at all, right? By the way, it's not what indigeneity means, it's not what apartheid means, it's not what the Holocaust means, it's not what genocide means. What Rabbi Weiss said about 80 years passing since, since the Holocaust, when I go to the Washington Holocaust Museum and I say to them, I understand, your fundamental question is how could it be? Right? How could it have been? Right? The notion. But are you teaching the International Holocaust Remembrance definition now? Because it is, again, right? How it can be, we can't prevent the past. But it is right now, anti-Zionism is the new strain of anti-Semitism. When you're teaching across high schools this important Holocaust curriculum, are you teaching today's strain of anti-Semitism that enable the atrocities of the Holocaust and enable the atrocities of 10-7? And the answer is no. The answer is no. And if you're not teaching today's strain of anti-Semitism, then actually what you're doing, and this breaks my heart, I said this, some legislators in Boston just told me that they're now gonna have genocide curriculum. First of all, the word genocide, we should shudder when we say that word. The word genocide and crimes against humanity, there were no terms that could describe the atrocities of the Holocaust. So they were created in order to be able to try in Nuremberg what it was that happened in the Holocaust. If everything is genocide, well then nothing is genocide, right? 
But genocide has a very important meaning, the systematic nature of it. And of course, Rwanda, it's not genocide was not just perpetuated against our people, not at all. But the understanding that genocide curriculum is going to be taught, and in the Orwellian inversion in which we live, that means that not only will genocide be taught, just like Holocaust study or Holocaust curriculum, it will be utilized to say, look at those Jews. They experienced the Holocaust, they experienced the genocide, and now they're perpetrating them. That's the understanding of today's world in which we live. So when we actually talk about teaching about the Holocaust, if we do so without teaching about the anti-Semitism anti that fueled or enabled the atrocities of the Holocaust, and fuel and enable the atrocities, the likes of which on 10-7 the Jewish people have not experienced since the Holocaust. And in that sense, that never again for us means never again are we going to wait for anybody to defend us. That's 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 the novelty. That's where 2023 is not 1943, right? The novelty in this situation is even if we die doing so, we're going to defend ourselves. But that's where North American Jews are going to have to be more brave. <laughs> To understand that we do have a nation state to which they return, which we return, even if they feel guilty that they don't live here, they're gonna have to get over it. They're just gonna have to, that's the psychology of the people. They're gonna have to get over that piece. They don't live here, it's true. But we do. And the understanding that their safety depends on the fact that we survive this, and that our safety depends on the fact that they speak up and are safe where they are on campus, on the streets, on is one that I think, again, we're in a historic moment. It's a first, I think, Rabbi, in which we have had that ability to relate as a people. One of my last conversations with the late Rabbi Sachs was like, are we ever going to actually be able to lean into our identity rather than be forced into our identity, right? The covenant of salvation, the covenant of faith versus covenant of destiny. Well, if we play this right, and that's where I have a great deal of hope, which I always quote the late Rabbi Sachs means you have to have action and courage. It doesn't mean it's gonna, you know, there's no windfall with hope. It's action and courage. If we play this right as a people and we unite and understand that this is our war and half of us are here and half of us are there and we're all boots on the ground to win this war, we could actually, for the first time in his history, positively um, uh, lean in or um, embrace our identity. Not be forced, I mean, we'll, we will have been forced on October 7th to lean into that identity. But I think of this as a historic moment that actually leaves us with a tremendous responsibility in our generation and certainly the next generation, the students on campuses now, that I say to them, I know you're brave and I know it's scary. And I've had to say to students just this, you know, last, I don't even remember where it was, last week or the week before that raised their hands and say, I'm afraid, I'm afraid on my campus. And I say, I know, war is really scary. And we are at war. There is a war that's raging. And it's harder when you're over there to feel the war because no one else feels there's a war. But I think that you know, we're at that spot, place, um, um, I'd say historic junction. So we're, we're coming soon to the end of our time. And I want to ask you one last question, both of you, to answer very quickly one last question. Um, but before I do, I just want to ask Rabbi Weiss, will you share one story about be perhaps the most challenging or the most meaningful experience you had in your activism. I have to say, well, as we're going through so many of the um, causes you were involved with, I remember all the years in shul and all the draw shows and <laughs> it brought back a lot of memories. Um, yeah. I knew that question was coming. <laughs> and Karen, in truth, I, I'm thinking about what's most meaningful about Medinat Israel in our activism? And I don't mean to shortchange the question, <laughs> but for me, what's most meaningful is everything. That's what I feel. That's what I feel. I'm a student of Rav Kook. He writes that Eretz Israel enena chitzomri. It's not external to my soul. Zoe Atzmuti. It's in my consciousness. Benafsho Kshura Benafsho. That's what I feel. And I feel that actually it's important for all of us to step back. You know, 
if you love someone, sometimes it's not so good to look too close. <laughs> You'll see warts and pimples. Sometimes you have to step back. In leadership, they call this go to the balcony. Uh -huh. It goes something like this. You're on the dance floor and somebody says, how is it going? Oh, it's so crowded. People are stepping on each other's toes. Now go to the balcony and look at the same scene. And you say, hmm, it's not that crowded. And people, not only are they not stepping on each other's toes, they're quite graceful. The Navi Yirmiyahu says it this way, Merachok Adonai Midali. Sometimes in love, you have to step back. And when I step back and I look at the Dinat Yisrael, my wife knows this. From the balcony of the Frat where our children, our Ilana, with her nine boys and girls live, I look out and I say totally, we spent half a century building one little building in Riverdale. Mm -hmm. And there are many people from Riverdale looking on in my love deep. Look totally. A whole state was built. A whole, excuse me, damn state <laughs> with an unbelievable army, with an unbelievable people. With Chokashvut, which is not a racist concept. It's one of the holiest laws that the Knesset ever passed. It says, never again will Jews have no place to go. That's what Eretz Yisrael is, and it's much more. Because if it's only a Chokashvut, then we exist to fight against something. Well, Eretz Yisrael is a proactive being, if you will. It is the place, the only place for the Jewish community where we have the sovereignty and autonomy to drive our own course, to carve our own destiny. You're doing it. I'm not doing it. You're living here. The only place where we can potentially do our share to bring light to the nations of the world and to ourselves to be an or like we. I remember the 75th anniversary, everyone was complaining. I'm so worried. My reaction is step back. Step back, step back with me for a minute. Look what this nation has accomplished in 75 years. When we started, we were 600,000 Jews, less than 5% of the Jewish population of the world. Today, with 9 million people here, well over 7 million Jews give out. 50% of the world Jewish community is here. The Jewish language, the Hebrew language, what a miracle. One could have put at the end of the 19th century, all Hebrew speakers in one Riverdale apartment building. <laughs> now, I can't understand my grandchildren. <laughs> Slow down. Absorption. Which nation absorbs a million and a half Soviet Jews? Several hundred thousand Ethiopian Jews are black brothers and sisters who didn't come here in the bowels of ships as they did to America to become slaves, but with all of the issues to come here and be free. There's more Torah being studied in Israel today than Torah studied at any time in all of Jewish history. When I step back, what's meaningful? It's all of that. We've got a wonderful congressman now, Richie Torres. I've renamed him Richie Tora. <laughs> we had a terrible congressman before that I went after. Who really is terrible. I won't even mention his name. Thank God he no longer represents Riverdale. Richie 
often says, I love Israel, not despite being a progressive, but because I'm a progressive. I'm not sure I'm in love with the word progressive. I'm out there, open and liberal, but I'll use it. <laughs> I couldn't agree with him more. To all of those universalists who believe in gay rights and feminism and environment, that's why I believe in Israel. Try all of those issues in Gaza. Just <laughs> try it. What's most meaningful to me? Oh. And what's most difficult? What's most difficult is open your hearts when we're not true to our mission. When we're not true to our mission to contribute light to the larger world and to ourselves. And the moment when I could remember this most, and there was one moment that changed me forever, was post Oslo, when I was leading the demonstrations against Prime Minister Rabin of Blessed Memory and Shimon Perez leading the demonstrations every day, hundreds, wherever they were. And there was such a split in our community. And then the assassination, which in my opinion was the greatest Hashem in all of Jewish history. What's most difficult, and here I'm saying something we all know, as the Ramchal writes in his introduction, I'm saying it for me to hear it and for you to listen. What's most difficult is when we're split. And I have a principle in spiritual activism <clears throat> that the rules of protesting against an external enemy are very different than the rules when we disagree within our own family. When we disagreed with Menem, who covered up Amiya. When we disagreed with the Pope, who was pushing for the convent in Auschwitz, when we had those disagreements, we didn't hold back. The rules were anything short of violence, we oppose any form of violence as a means of social action, but we did whatever we wanted to do. But when it comes to Am Israel, join me in this prayer. It's my brother. It's my sister. It's my family. It's my child. The love I have for my child, no matter what my child does, no matter what my brother and my sister does, if it's a family that's working, it's an unconditional love. And even the way I say I disagree has to be different. I offer the Tehillah, and I know you join me, that the Yachdut on Israel that we're feeling now as a reaction to 10 7, it being a Yachdut that continues after this Hashem, we're going to be victorious in this war. That is our greatest challenge today to listen to the other side, to recognize I don't have a monopoly on knowing what's right. The other side is a side that I can learn from as well. Ahdut Israel, Avat Israel. Thank you. Wow. Uh, I want to give you each 30 seconds <laughs> for the last question. And then Rabbi Weiss, you, you did promise us something. <laughs> so uh, 30 seconds on what message we have some young people here including three of my children hopefully they're still here uh, and uh, and I know we this will hopefully be heard by many of our youth what message do you want to share about positive activism positive Israel activism with the next generation so, so I, I spoke a lot about the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition. That's our response to be able to comprehensively identify and combat the challenge. But I actually would like to refer and to remind us of Israel's Declaration of Independence, because that's the positive. So Declaration of Independence clearly stipulates actually everything that Rabbi Weiss just spoke about. Right? Israel is the nation state 
of the Jewish people, a prototypical indigenous people that returned to an ancestral homeland after thousands of years of exile and persecution committed to equality. That's just the Declaration of Independence. That's not me. I think that as we live at this moment in time, the miraculous 75 year young, and 75 is very young, and democracy is a messy, messy, messy business, as all of us know. And I know that I'm speaking to people who actually give me a great sense of hope. Um, because I think that every Ole and Ola that come to this country, they carry a piece of that knowledge of the Declaration of Independence intuitively. Everyone here is actually a change agent for what I believe um, Rabbi Weiss spoke about and the infectious understanding of Ole that came here because of the Lechicha call, right? Because Israel is the nation state of our indigenous people returned to our ancestral homeland after thousands of years of exile and persecution committed to equality. To me, that is the most important response to being able to rebuild once we win this war and ensure that that, that unity that's right now, people are fighting, it doesn't matter if they were pro-reform or against reform or right or left or religious or secular. Right now, our kids are all fighting together. And I think that that is I very much hope what we carry with us um, as we win this war and, and continue to build what I call the next tier. We only built the first tier in these 75 years. We're, we're hardly done. And our shared project, including with our brothers and sisters around the world, is not at all finished. So I very much hope that, that's, that, that the under, understanding of the Declaration of Independence is what propels us forward for the next 75 years. In the world of activism, it's often the case that there are people who stand with us and identify their Judaism by their standing up to anti-Semitism. And that's very important. But if that is my reason for being Jewish, I call that reactive Judaism. As important as it is, it's negative Judaism, because I'm defining myself by what I'm against. Maybe we can make up a new word. It's against Nick Judaism. <laughs> and nothing against Nick, nothing reactive in yours. Leadership is change. Change is in response to a challenge. It's a reaction. But if it remains a reaction and doesn't turn proactive, we're in trouble. So for me, spiritual activism, I'm glad you asked this question, is not only standing up at the barricades, but seeing that the barricades is the conduit to seeing and recognizing the people what Judaism is all about. What's it, what is it all about, the Kitsur? The PowerPoints would be, number one, <laughs> to teach and inculcate a Judaism, a Torah, which is loving, loving, a loving Torah. The recent, recent thematic commentary on the Torah, transgressed to pen, I call it Torah Dava, loving Torah. God is a God of love. And contrary to what Martin Luther says, who has problems with ritual, because he says it's too constricting, I humbly think the reverse. It's a God of love who commands. It's to teach our children the love of Torah, that Shabbat and Kashrut and all of that, not only teaching them what it is, but why it is. It's given by a God who loves us, who wants these laws to enhance <laughs> our lives. And not only must it be a loving Torah, it's got to be a non coercive teaching. Religious coercion and spiritual striving are oxymorons. It doesn't work. I love the Milton Steinberg essay where he writes, when we love our children or teach our children, embrace them 
with open arms. Embrace them, open arms. To give our children the wings, yes. But where they fly, that's their decision. Yes, to show the way, but don't be overpowering in that coercion. Because yatsas haro behefsedo. It's to teach a loving Torah. It's to teach a Torah which is non-coercive. I love you with open arms. Mirachet. Like the mother bird doesn't crush the eggs, but hovers. It's much more difficult to be a parent like that, a <laughs> teacher like that. That's why I told my wife when we said the Baruch Shev Tarani for our daughters and son, I said, I don't want to say it. I don't want to let them go. Mm -hmm. And that's my third point. We have to teach and love our children in such a way that we recognize that they will become not necessarily who we are. And whoever they become, we have to embrace them. We have to love them. They're not who we are. Hopefully they'll walk in our footsteps. They'll do it in their own way. That's what we need now, I believe, more than ever. We need to teach a Judaism, and this is activism. This is turning reactive, the barrier of protest, into a proactive spiritual activism. Judaism is a love story. God is a God of love. The Torah, with all of its regulations, I'm fully aware of it. The Torah is a book of love. And to love our children, again, I'm repeating, with open arms, no matter what they do, where they go. It's like this couple that came to me and said, Rabbi, what am I going to do with, with our daughter? She's not keeping Shabbat. And after an hour discussion, I said what I wanted to say an hour earlier. Mm -hmm. Love her. But she is violating the Shabbat publicly. And my response was, love her even more. Love her even more. That, I think, is the gateway. That, I think, is the way to teach our children <laughs> and our students. And what a joy it's been, Michal, to be with you. So I want to share. Finally, something very personal. I was born in 1944, at the tail end of the war. I'm almost 80 years old. We actually came here to celebrate Toby, my wife's 80th birthday, and then the war started. What is a chut to be here now? What is a chut? Israel is a dream. The dream with Israel means to be there not only in good times, but in the rougher times. And in the end, the good times, the good times will prevail. And I realized that the young Abby Weiss is, is getting up there. <laughs> I'm getting close to the way I remember my father <laughs> in the last quarter of his life. It's not my time. It's your time. It's your time. I feel this with all my heart and soul. Whatever success I feel now, it's not mine. It's watching for me. Students at Yeshivat Chobavei Torah, Yeshivat Marat, the rabbi of our synagogue now, Rabbi Stephen Exler. What a dream to see these institutions with Sarah Horowitz and Doug Linzer reaching new levels. And when I listen to you, Karen, and Michal, when I listen to you, I don't mean this, God forbid, in a condescending way. I mean it in the most uplifting way, Michal. My heart sings. My heart sings. You have to know when to step back. And I've learned when to step back. It's your time. And we couldn't be in better hands. We've been escorted to be able to host you in Matana Shalom.
Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. <laughs> Going together just as we started into Fila. <clears throat> Let's end up Fila. But please join me as you can see. The rallies have <laughs> affected <laughs> my vocal cords, as my ENT doctor says. <laughs> so let's join together. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.